What is the Schotter's disability? I come to this topic from my work on emotions in rabbinic literature, looking at how the rabbis perceived and tried to manage human emotionality, especially how they tried to uh, integrate it, the emotionality, into what they had in mind as the halachic person, the person who they expected to be a member of the halachic culture. While the status of rabbinic culture is still a point of scholarly study, debate, and ideology, it is more or less accepted now that in the early period, the Tanaitic period, the rabbis were in a position of establishing their position, while since the Amoraic period, they eventually became quite hegemonic in what could, from that period onward, uh, be termed uh, Jewish society. Now, since according to the theories with which I work on emotions, emotions are not universal, my attempt is to try to distance myself from our perception of human emotionality and allow myself to recognize the unrecognized mentalities in rabbinic discourse. From this standpoint, I also look at the Shoté. Recently, Leonard uh, Lamehouse completed a study about the Shoté in rabbinic sources, a study which will appear in Lace in the Metzler's edited volume, Natural Born Fools, Intellectual Disabilities in the Ancient World from Theoretical Conce Concepts to Daily Life, a volume which is uh, to appear in the Breipols this year. It is in press now. Lamehouse was very kind uh, to let me um, see the study before the publication is finalized, and this was very helpful for me in preparing this presentation. From La Lamehouse's analysis, it is clear that the rabbi used the term shote as an, I'm quoting, umbrella term that was simultaneously very difficult to define, but open to conceptual adjustment. And, end quote. and indeed, the halachic meaning of this term developed throughout time and also between corpora. My work here will focus on something which is tangent to the issue of the Shote, but will converge with it uh, toward the end. We find in the Mishnah and in other places that the Shote has no Da'at. The Shote is mentioned in this context, together with the deaf mute, the cheresh, and the minor, the katan. A list of three personae which uh, uh, appears uh, regularly together in rabbinic literature. Cheresh, shoteh, ve katan, nidarim ve ne'erachin, aval lo nodrin ve lo ma'arichin, mipnei she'ein bahem da'at. The text is from Sephira, and so is the translation. The deaf mute, the shote, and the minor are the object of a vow and are valuated, but neither vow to donate the assessment of a person nor take a vow of valuation because they lay, lack the presumed mental competence. And Sepharia has here to make a commitment, but this is not uh, in the Hebrew. These uh, three categories cannot perform certain halachic uh, actions uh, that have to do with, in this case, uh, vows, because they have no da'at. What this text does not say is that being of no da'at is being a shote. It says that being without da'at is a characteristic of the Shote and the two other uh, categories. So I want to look for the meaning of having no dat. The way to do it was to look what dat actually means. What I found was not really what I expected. And it forces us to nuance our idea about dat and eventually uh, about the Shote as well uh, and some familiar usages of this term uh, dat, as we will see. What I found is that having no dat does not mean that someone has 
mental disorder or intellectual disability. But having no dot means that one does not have self-initiated intention toward a specific action. So da'at means having self-initiated intention toward a specific action. It means that a person with da'at is an agent, acts on his own volition and own initiative. Uh, he has a plan that an, an intention to perform a specific action. So agented, self-driven, with a plan of a specific action. Specific action meaning not a general doing a PhD, but buying this particular ice cream. The action could be non-material as well, such as uh, speaking, you know, to say something. This find is uh, valid for Palestinian literature only, since the use in the Bavli in the Aramaic context uh, is different. In rabbinic literature, we find various types of people who are without that. Not all of them are shote. So the category of being without that is a larger category than the shote. Also, the shote eventually became a larger category than only a person without that. Is it, is it either became eventually or, or was this from the beginning? The Shote is defined or described in the Tosefta and later interpretation in the Amoraic Halachic literature as having certain behaviors which are socially deviant or irregular. This is not equal to being without that as well. Also, the Shote is a larger category than only being without that, as the other two um, partners for exclusion as well. In the Tosefta and later in the interpretation uh, in the Amoraic Halachic literature of this Tosefta passage, certain behaviors which are socially deviant or irregular are defining or describing the Shote, and this is certainly not only being without that, even though uh, it, is, it possibly means that the person is also without that. Lamehouse works uh, analyzes quite closely these uh, texts from the Tosefta and the uh, and the Yerushalmi, so I refer you to his work. I will not deal with these texts here. Let us look at a few cases that show that uh, self-initiated initiative for a specific action is the best way to understand the term da'at. Uh, all translations are from uh, Safaria. From Mishnah Trumot, about the giving of a truma, which is a priestly gift, which is somewhat flexible in its scope. It could be 1 60th, 50th, or 40th of the GDP of a person. Here is a case where a person gives his truma using a messenger. The messenger, asserts the Mishnah, should give a truma of the value intended by, according to the dot of, the sender. If the messenger does not know the dot of the messenger, but still intends to give it according to the dot of the sender, giving 10 parts more or less than what the sender wanted is fine. However, if the messenger knows the dot of the sender, but he himself adds even one part, not 10 parts, even one part more because of his own dot, then the truma is not valid. Obviously, there is no intellectual debate here, and the knowledge that comes from uh, comes to the fore is not any sophisticated halachic knowledge. There is an intention for a specific action, which is um, self-initiated by the sender. As long as the messenger's intention is to follow the dot of the sender, even if the knowledge is mistaken and the action uh, is, is different, the action is still valid. However, if the amount is almost right, yeah, only 1% more, 
but it follows the dot of the messengers, messenger, not the sender, the act is invalid. So what we learn here is the non-intellectual nature of that and that it is the intention to act. Since the sum itself is not the most important thing, by knowingly not acting according to the sender's dot, the uh, messenger changes the dot of the sender, so to speak, albeit not the intention, and even improves maybe on it. However, this renders the truma invalid. The next uh, passage talks about leading an animal using the voice. The context is the rule of kilayim, the, the rule that says that uh, um, it is not allowed to plow with two animals of different uh, species, not even uh, if you lead them using the voice. However, in a different context, one of the Shabbat limits, when an animal wanders away beyond the, the limit, it is allowed to lead her back using the voice. Why is it forbidden to voice lead the animal in the first case and it is allowed to voice lead her in the second case? The answer is that in the second case, the animal walks toward the owner of her own da'at. Here again, the voluntary self-initiated action is the important aspect that comes to the fore, using the term dot. And again, it, is, it has nothing to do with knowledge or intellectual setting. The last case is, is quite, uh, quite horrible. It is about children that play with lambs. They tie the tails of the lambs one to the other, and in one case, the, the, the tail broke. Now, the, this particular lamb happened to be a firstborn, and thus originally forbidden to be eaten, since all firstborns are dedicated to God. But this one now is uh, with a blemish, so uh, not one to be dedicated to God. Therefore, the sages allowed to use it, that is, to eat it. When they, and we don't know who they are, the children or, or owners of lambs in general, uh, when they uh, heard this or, or saw that the, the sages allowed to, to use this lamb, this lamb, they went and tied tails of other firstborns. But the rabbis did not allow those to be used since the rule is uh, the following, everything that is according to his da'at is forbidden. If it is not according to, the, to his da'at, it is allowed. That is, if you perform, if the owner performs the blemishing act as a self-initiated intention for this specific act, he cannot benefit from this act, i.e. to eat this lamb. If the harm is caused unintentionally, then uh, the animal is not uh, dedicated to God anymore and it is allowed to be used. Again, it is not an intellectual setup. Uh, it depends on the person initiating or yeah, the, the, the intention of this action. Yeah, it, we, we don't even talk about the action itself, but if they intended for the action to be this action. This is where the place of that comes uh, into the narrative. So let us look now at how we re-understand uh, the term that's in familiar context with this new understanding uh, in mind. Uh, there are many such examples of re-understanding that, but this one is uh, particularly nice because it is such a, a well-known uh, text. It is in the context of celebrating the Pesach, uh, which, is, uh, which entails also doing symbolic actions that uh, reference historical or mythological events. Uh, the children of the family are supposed to ask about the meaning of these, uh, these symbolic actions. Uh, children of three types, as the Mishnah has it, ask various uh, questions. And a fourth type of children does not know how to ask, or does not know to ask, as the Hebrew has it. 
the Mishnah refers to this type of a boy as someone who has no dat. If we think of dat as referring to knowledge, uh, this setup would make it, it would make the, the meaning of dat here would make no sense. Are the other children knowledgeable? If they are, why should they uh, ask the question in the first place? Just in order to get an explanation about something they already know? However, if we think of that as self-initiated intention to act, uh, the context becomes very clear. Yeah? The, the meaning of that here becomes very clear. This boy does not initiate asking the question because he has no self-initiated intention to act. And acting here refers to asking. In this case, the father should initiate giving the explanation in, spe in spite of the fact that the child did not ask any question. So while all other children don't understand, ask, and get the answer, the doubtless child does not ask but still gets the explanation. The new understanding of that nuances or rather clarifies what we felt was the meaning of the problem of the fourth boy, but here we see that this is indeed the original meaning of that, and uh, it is the way the, the expression appears in the Mishnah. Uh, now here we have some cases where the new understanding of that clarifies its use in some collocations, yeah, in combination with other words. The first one is uh, from the Tosefta, is about Gneva Da'at, the stealing of Da'at. The Tosefta talks about and disapproves um, of receiving something, money for example, for one purpose and using it for another purpose, because this would be stealing the Da'at of the person who gave the money in the first place. His dad was directed toward one activity and the person in question performed another. So the dad was stolen, so to speak, from the, the person who had it toward the person who did the other activity. Another case is uh, the collocative of khulshat dat, weakness of dat. Here it is from the, a 10th century text, pretty late, but it reflects the renewed understanding of, uh, of that very nicely. It is a letter by the Gaon of Pumpedita to the Iraqi, the Babylonian congregation in Fustat in, in ancient Cairo, uh, which complains, yeah, the letter complains, Gam hechlashtem etateinu kilo shlachtem you made our dat weak because you did not send your contribution, yeah, your, your money. He's actually saying that the fact that you did not send money uh, made it difficult for us to have dat, to have self-initiated intention toward a specific action. We cannot plan our action because we don't have the financial support for it. At the period he and his brother were in a conflict, uh, power conflict, a power struggle with another Gaonic family in, in the same yeshiva. Uh, let's look at the term Da'at or Da'atless actually in the Beit Midrash uh, context, yeah, the rabbinic uh, institution, the rabbinic academy if you want. We find the, the term Da'at also in, the, in this context these cases are interesting because uh, we can see the nuance between that and other context of uh, intellectual ability uh, yeah, or scholarly abilities uh, done in the Beit Midrash. Uh, I want to start with a relatively late text again, uh, Avod Rabbi Natan, because uh, the issue at hand is the characteristics of Talmidim, students of the scholarly institution. I focus on uh, one list of four types of students. There are many uh, such lists, but I focus on one in which uh, the first two have to do with the A, which is not exactly that. So for the time being, I will not be talking about it, even though some manuscripts do have uh, the term that here. Uh, but the last two have to do with 
that yeah the, the, of the four the last two cases the first of the two is a student who learned the whole program yeah bible mishnah midrash halachot and agadot and he has no da'at to leheshiv yeah to 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 answer so to speak which i would translate uh, more as to refute yeah? refuting what he has read uh, the last in the list of four um, which means that he is uh, of the of the best quality of students has learned the same as the previous but he has that to refute when we understand that as self-initiated intention toward an action the statement in Avodah Rabbi Natan is quite clear in the first case, the Talmud, the student, does not initiate refutation of what he has learned. And the second, in the second case, he, he does initiate it. That is, he is so immersed in what he has learned that he does not fear questioning it yeah, and, and debating with this. This is considered the best type of student. Both students are well educated. Yeah, They both went through the whole program of the Beit Midrash. The next text is from the Mishnah and the Tosefta, a famous passage about not teaching sensitive material about incest, creation and Merkava, yeah, the architecture of the heavenly realm, even to a small audience. Unless, and here comes the Da'at, the student is a Chacham and understood it already from his own da'at, that is from self-initiation to know yeah, this material of the Merkava. Yeah, so the agented student is the focus here, not only as wise, but as someone who has already the intention to do this act of learning it. So he is going to learn it, yeah, whether we teach it or not. The next case, very shortly, uh, is a passage, a passage from the Mechilta, stating that it's uh, very bad to take bribe, of course, uh, as it says in, in, in Exodus 23.8, for a gift blinds them who have sight. Those who have sight, says the Mechilta, is pikhei da'at. And who are the pikhei da'at? says the Mechilta, they are the ones who declare purity or impurity on their own. Yeah, so they do it on their own initiative. They don't ask other, others, they don't cooperate with others. They have the initiative to declare, which is the action, and thus to have things pure or impure. So they would be blinded by the gift. Again, if we apply our understanding of that, which focuses on the agency, yeah, the self-reliance, the self-initiated um, action of the doer, agency in terms of this intention, it is especially dangerous if these people get bribes because there will not be any social control because they act on their own, there will not be any social control on their decision because they are pikhaidat, they have their own initiative. In all the cases studied here, da'at refers to agented intention to act on the part of the person or, or an animal, and the explanation of stupid or unlearned is a less good explanation uh, of, uh, of the text. So back to the shote. So the shote lacks da'at, and da'at means self-driven, self-initiated intention toward a specific action. And this is the halachic description of the shote. Yeah? This is one of the characteristics of the shote. Now, how is the character of the shote seen or represented in narrative contexts which are non-halachic? So here are two cases. Both cases are from the Tanchuma, a text that represents a section of the culture which was familiar with the Bet Midrash culture, but it is not part and parcel of this culture. It is more popular um, as, as it was created for the synagogue context, not the Bet Midrash context. 
The one case is a parable where the protagonist is a shote, a shote slave, avid shote of a priest. And this shote uh, goes to look for his master in the cemetery. And he's being mocked for it by, uh, by the people, obviously, because one cannot find a priest in a cemetery. Priests don't go into cemeteries. Thus, the shote's action is futile. In the second case, we hear uh, that uh, Esau was mocking Cain in his heart as a fool, as a shote, since he killed his brother. But he didn't realize, Cain didn't realize that Adam would continue to multiply, as indeed Seth was born. So again, someone is characterized as a shote because his action was futile. In both, both cases, the self-initiated action of the shote ended up not being the action intended. It is not worthy to, to, to recognize the gap here between the halachic la language and the non-jargonic one. We can nicely see how the halachic language crystallizes the natural language term to fit into categories that are meaningful for itself, for the halacha. Futile action of the natural language being translated into invalid halachic action. Definitely what we see here is an evolving tendency toward classification and more nuanced distinction uh, as Lamehouse uh, formulated it in his uh, for aforementioned uh, article. Returning to the trilogy uh, of the excludees, yeah, the ones excluded, on page 168, Lamehouse says, it is intriguing that rabbinic discourse groups together the deaf mute, the shote, and the minor. Yeah, so these three non dat people are grouped together, and this is intriguing. Uh, apparently, this question must have intrigued the rabbis as well, at least those of the Amoraic period. Uh, as they also question this combination and they solve, they, they give an answer in a form of a midrash. So the explanation, explanation the midrash is first found in the Yerushalmi, but I will use uh, the clearer formulation in the Tanhuma. So what the Tanhuma says in the Yerushalmi that all these, how come these three are grouped together? It is because they all come from one verse in Exodus 25 two. Speak to the children of Israel that they take from me an offering of every man whose heart makes him willing, you shall take my offering. So the Tanhuma said the deaf is excluded because he does not hear and speak. Yeah, so speak to the children, this he, he does not hear. The shote is ex excluded because his heart is not willing. And this is how the shote is perceived. He cannot, uh, of his own thought, want to give. And the katan is not included because he's not an ish. Me'et kol ish asher libo. This midrashic solution exemplifies nicely the cultural gap between the Mishnah where this list, uh, which, where, in which this list of uh, excludees uh, originates, and the Amoraim who felt the need to explain this list. This means that the list was not self-evident for the later period as it was for the people of the Mishnah. Finally, is the lack of self-initiated intention toward a particular action a disability? Definitely not. As we saw, even among themselves, the rabbis themselves, among the Talmudim, there were those who lacked that. We usually find uh, in rabbinic literature a gap between, uh, sort of distinction between their discourse about themselves, uh, what they expect their, of the rabbinic person, and their discourse about the general public, what they expect of the halachic person. So even a rabbinic person can be without that. Did they think about the shoteh 
as having a mental or intellectual disability. For this, you have to read Lamehouse's work, but I may just let you know that the picture is quite complex. Thank you for listening.